What's up, YouTube? Welcome back. In today's video, we're going to continue the CompTIA Pentest Plus series on TriHackMe. We will be going over the introductory networking room. So this room is going to be an introduction to networking theory and basic networking tools. So for this room, we won't need to start a VM. So we'll go ahead and get started with task one. So introduction. The aim of this room is to provide a beginner's introduction to the basic principles of networking. Networking is a massive topic, so this really will just be a brief overview. However, it'll hopefully give you some foundational knowledge of the topic, which can which you can build upon yourself. So it's going to cover the OSI model, the TCP IP model, how the models look in practice, and then an introduction to basic networking tools. So go ahead and complete that. On to task number two, the OSI model and overview. So the OSI model or Open Systems Interconnection model is a standardized model which we use to demonstrate the theory behind computer networking. In practice, it's actually the more compact TCP IP model that the real world networking is based off of. However, the OSI model in many ways is easier to get an initial understanding from. So the OSI model consists of seven layers, the application layer, presentation layer, session, transport, network, data link, and physical. So there are many different mnemonics floating around to help you learn the layers of the OSI model. For example, there's the anxious, pale, Shakespeare treated, nervous, drunks, patiently. Anxious, pale, Shakespeare treated, nervous, drunks, patiently. Personally, I don't like that one. Uh, so let's briefly take a look at each of these in turn. So layer seven. The application layer. The application layer of the OSI model essentially provides networking options to programs running on a computer. It works almost exclusively with the applications, providing an interface for them to use in order to transmit data. When data is given to the application layer, it is then passed down to the presentation layer. And the presentation layer, which is going to be layer, is layer six is the presentation layer. So the presentation layer gets data from the application in a format that's understandable, but receiving application layer may not understand that format. So the presentation layer then changes the data into a standardized format and handles the encryption, compression, or other changes. It then sends the data from the, from the presentation layer to the session layer, which is going to be session five or layer five. So layer five, the session layer checks if it can connect with other computers. If it can, it maintains the connection and synchronizes communication with the other computer's session layer. This creates a unique session that prevents data mix-ups when making multiple requests. Once the connection is established, the data is then passed on to the transport layer. Layer four, the transport layer. So the transport layer chooses how data is transmitted using either TCP or UDP. TCP creates a reliable connection between computers, ensuring all data is sent and received accurately through the TCP handshake, making it good for file transfers or web page loading. UDP is faster but less reliable, making it better for video streaming like Netflix. Transport layer then breaks the transmission into smaller pieces to make it easier to send. And then layer three, the network layer. So the network layer finds where your quest needs to go. It uses logical addressing like IP addresses to categorize and organize networks. The most common types of logical addressing is IPv4, which uses addresses like 192.168.1.1, for example, which is more common for home networks or home routing. And then layer two, the data link layer. So the data link layer adds the physical address or the MAC address to a packet received from the network layer. So each computer has a unique MAC address or media access control address burned into its network interface card. The data link layer also ensures that the data is in the right format for transmission and checks for any errors or corruption during transmission. Then layer one, the physical layer. So the physical layer is a hardware layer that sends and receives electrical pulses for data transfer on a network. It converts the binary data from signals and then sends them and receives incoming signals and then converts them back to binary data. On to the questions. So which layer would which layer would choose to send data over TCP or UDP? That'll be the layer four. And physical one, so Going based off this chart, layer one is the physical layer, layer two is data link, layer three network, layer four is the transport, layer five session, layer six presentation, and then layer seven application.
So which layer checks received information to make sure that it hasn't been corrupted? That'll be layer two, the data link layer. Next question, in which layer would data be formatted in preparation for transmission? That'll be layer two, the data link layer. Which layer transmits and receives data? That'll be layer one, the physical layer. Which layer encrypts, compresses, or otherwise transforms the initial data to give it a standardized format? That'll be layer six, the presentation layer. Which layer tracks communications between the host and receiving computer? That'll be layer five, the session layer. Next question. Which layer accepts communication requests from the applications? That'll be layer seven, the application layer. Which layer handles logical addressing? That'll be layer three, the network layer. When sending data over TCP, would you, what would you call the bite-sized pieces of data? You would call them segments. <clears throat> so this one's gonna say research. Which layer would the FTP protocol communicate with? That'll be layer seven. Which transport layer protocol would best be suited to transmit a live video? So as we saw in the UDP one, it'll be UDP. On to task number three, encapsulation. So encapsulation, each layer of the model adds specific information to the data at the beginning of the transmission. For example, the network layer adds the source and destination IP addresses, and the transport layer adds information specific to the protocol being used. The data link layer adds a piece at the end of the transmission to verify that the data wasn't corrupted during transmission. This process is called encapsulation and allows data to be sent from one computer to another securely. So as you see, there's stage one, where in the application layer header is added, stage two, the presentation layer header is added, stage three, session layer header is added, stage four, transport layer header is added, stage five, network layer, network layer header is added, stage six, the data link header and, ta and trailer are added. So here's layer two header and then the trailer. And then stage seven, encapsulated data is sent across the network. Encapsulated data is named differently at each step of the process. The data is referred to as a segment or datagram in the transport layer, a packet in the network layer, a frame in the data link layer, and bits when transmitted across the network. When the message is received, the process is reversed through de-encapsulation. So these processes provide a standardized method for sending data across networks, ensuring that any device can communicate with another regardless of the manufacturer or operating system used. On to the questions. Question one, how would you refer to data at layer two of the encapsulation process with the OSI model? That'll be frames. Question two, how would you refer to data at layer four of the encapsulation process with the OSI model if the UDP protocol has been selected? So that'll be datagrams. So what process would a computer perform on a received message? That'll be encapsulation. Oops. De encapsulation. Next question. Which is the only layer of the OSI model to add a trailer during enca encapsulation? That would be data link layer. Does encapsulation provide an extra layer of security? A or nay? That would be A. On to task number four, the TCP IP model. So the TCP IP model in many ways is very similar to the OSI model. It's a little bit older and serves as the basis for real world networking. The TCP IP model consists of four layers, the application, transport, internet, and network interface. Between them, these covers the same range of functions as the seven layers of the OSI model. So the way I like to look at it, if you're in Texas, the, you see the tolls, the NITA, so like NIT8, that's why I remember the different layers for network interface, internet, transport, and application. So some recent sources split the TCP IP model into five layers, breaking the network interface layer into data link and physical layers, as with the OSI model. So you would be justified in asking why we bother with the OSI model if it's not actually used for anything in the real world. The answer to that question is quite simply that the OSI model tends to be easier for learning the initial theory of networking. So the two models match up like this. So application covers session, presentation, and application in the OSI model. And the TCP IP model, transport covers transport, 
and then internet covers network, and then network interface covers the physical and data link layer. <clears throat> so the process of encapsulation and de-encapsulation work in exactly the same way with the TCP IP model as they do with the OSI model. At each layer of the TCP IP model, a header is added during encapsulation and then removed during de-encapsulation. So TCP IP is a suite of protocols that defines how actions are carried out. The two most important protocols are the TCP or transmission control protocol and the internet protocol or IP. TCP is connection based, meaning a stable connection must be formed between two computers before data can be sent. This is done through a process called three-way handshake. The initiating computer sends a send bit to a remote server, which responds with a packet containing the send and ACK bits. And then finally, the initiating computer sends a packet with only the ACK bit to confirm that the connection is set up. This creates a lossless connection where lost or corrupted data is then resent. So as we can see, client sends SIN, server sends a SIN ACK, and then the client responds with an ACK. And then there's the history if you want to if you want to read the history a little bit. On to the question, which model was introduced first, the OSI, the OSI model or the TCP IP? So that'll be TCP IP. Which layer of the TCP IP model covers the functionality of the transport layer of the OSI model? That'll be the transport layer. Now, which layer of the TCP IP model covers the functionality of the session layer of the OSI model? That'll be application. The network interface layer of the TCP IP model covers the functionality of two layers in the OSI model. These datas are the data link and the physical. Oops, misspelled that. Next question, which layer of the TCP IP model handles the functionality of the OSI network layer? That would be internet. And then which or what kind of protocol is TCP is going to be connection based. And then UDP is connectionless. And then what is SYN short for or what is SYN short for? That'll be synchronize. If I can spell. What is the second step of the three-way handshake? That'll be the SYN act. And then what is the short name for the acknowledgement segment in a three-way handshake? That'll be ACK. On to task five, ping. So these are, this is when we'll get into the networking tools. So ping. The ping command tests if a connection to a remote server is possible. Like a website on the internet or a computer on your home network, it uses the ICMP protocol on the network layer of the OSI model and the internet layer of the TCP IP model. The syntax is ping in the target, as we can see here and here, so ping google.com. And it can also be used to determine the IP address of the server hosting your website. Ping is supported on all OSs and even most embedded devices. You can use the mad ping command on Linux to learn more about the syntax. So what command would you use to ping bbc.co.uk? You'll do ping bbc.co.uk. Let's open up a terminal for the next command or for the next question. Go ahead, hit ping, paste that in there. And then there is the IP address. Next question. So which switch lets you change the interval of the sent IP request, sent ping request, that would be the dash I option. Which switch would allow you to restrict request to IPv4, be the dash four. And then which switch would you give, which switch would give a more verbose output, that would be dash V. On to test number six, traceroute. So for traceroute, the logical follow-up 
So the logical follow-up to the pink command is trace route. Trace route can be used to map the path your request takes as it heads to the target machine. So the internet is made up of many different servers and endpoints all networked up to each other. This means that in order to get the content you actually want, you first need to go through a bunch of other servers. Trace route allows you to see each of these different connections. It allows you to see every intermediate step between your computer and the resource that you requested. So the basic the basic syntax for trace route on Linux will be trace route and then the destination. So by default, Windows trace route utilities called trace cert. So it's just trace route shortened technically, basically. It operates using the same ICMP protocol that Ping utilizes, and the Unix equivalent operates over UDP. This can be altered with switches in both instances. And here's the example showing traceroute on Google.com. And then you can see that it took 13 hops to get from this person's router to the Google server. So there are all these different hops it took. Use traceroute on tryhackme.com. Can you see the path that your request has taken? Back to our terminal. Clear this out and then trace route and then try hackme.com. And then this is the path that my machine took. What switch would you use to specify an interface when using trace route? That'll be dash I. What switch would you use if you wanted to use the TCP send request when tracing the route? That'll be dash T. And then <clears throat> lateral thinking. Which layer of the TCP IP model will trace route run on by default? The internet. And on to task number seven, networking tools, who is? Who is essentially allows you to query who a domain name is registered to. In Europe, personal details are redacted. However, elsewhere, you can potentially get a great deal of information from a WHOIS search. So there's a web version of who is if you click this link, it'll be who is dot com. And then you can run this command over here on your Linux terminal to install who is this will update your machine first and then it'll install who is using app git. So running who is on B on BBC dot co dot UK, you see the following output, the domain name, data validation, the registrar, relevant datas, registration status, name servers, and more. So perform a who is on Facebook. Clear your terminal and then run who is and then facebook.com. So from this output, we see a ton of different data from the domain name, the registry domain, who is URL, the status, the name server, if you scroll down, you get to see where it's registered, the city, the street address, the postal code, the country, the phone number, and the email. And it shows you all this, all this data, the admin, the tech. What is the registered postal code for Facebook? So if we see, it'll be this, this guy right here. Oops. When was the facebook.com domain first registered? So if we see over here, it'll be March 29th, 1977, 1997. So 03, 29, 1997. We probably need to put in different format. Oh, date. So the day, the month, and then the year 1997. And then perform a who is on Microsoft.com. Who is Microsoft.com? Same thing. Shows you all this wonderful information. Shows you where it's registered, city, postal code, country, phone number, etc. So which city is the registrant, registrant based in? So this would be Redmond. And then OSINT, what is the name of the golf course that is near the registrant address for Microsoft.com? So if we go to Google Maps, 
go ahead and type the register address. So what is the name of the golf course that is near the register address? Back to our terminal. So it'll be one way. So it'll be one way. So the street will be one, <coughs> one Microsoft way. And then Redmond, Washington. Let's go ahead and copy that. Paste that into Google. Oops, I put an A there. Let's go ahead and put an O. So here it is, Microsoft headquarters. And then if you look for golf courses, there's Marmore Park. And then Bellevue Golf Course, there's the golf course. Go ahead and copy the name. What is the registrant tech email for Microsoft? So tech email. Go ahead and look for that tech email. Here we go. It's this guy. Task number eight, the dig tool. At the most basic level, DNS allows us to ask a special server to give us the IP address of the website that we're trying to access. For example, if we made a request to www.google.com, our computer would first send a request to a special DNS server, which your computer already knows how to find, and then the server would then go looking for the IP address for Google and then send it back to us. Our computer could then send the request to the IP of the Google server. But let's break this down a bit. So DNS allows us to ask a special server for the IP address of the website we want to access. When we want to request a website, our computer first checks its local cache for the IP address. If it's not there, our computer then sends a request to the recursive DNS server, which is automatically known to our router. So this server maintains a cache of results for popular domains, but if it doesn't have the information, it passes the request to a root name server. There are many root name servers that keep track of the DNS servers in the next level down called the top level domain servers or TLD. TLD servers are split into extensions like .com or .co.uk, and they keep track of the next level down. Authoritative name servers. So authoritative name servers store DNS records for do domains directly, and when our request reaches the authoritative name server for the domain we're querying, it then sends a relevant information back to us. So when we visit a website in the web browser, this all happens automatically because we can also do it manually using but we can also do it manually using a tool called dig like so like ping and trace route dig should be installed automatically on linux systems so if you run dig the domain and then the dns server ip for example dig google.com at 1.1.1.1 it'll show you this output over here so there's a lot of information here but we're currently interested in the answer output so this output right here And it'll also show you the TTL, which is the time to live. So this piece of information that Dig gives us is the TTL or time to live of the query DNS record. As mentioned previously, when your computer creates a domain name, it stores the results in its local cache and the TTL of the record tells your computer when to stop considering the record as being valid. So this should request the data again rather than relying on the cache copy. So the TTL is measured in seconds. So the record in this example will expire in two minutes and 37 seconds. What is DNS? What is DNS short for? Domain name system. So what is the first type of DNS server your computer would query when you search for a domain? It'll be the recursive domain. It'll be the recursive server. So what type of DNS server contains records specific to domain extensions? Using the long version of the name, that'll be the top, top level domain. Next question. So where is the very first place your computer would look to find the IP address of a domain? So it'll start by looking in your local cache. 
So this question is going to ask us to research. Google runs two public DNS servers. One of them can be queried with the IP 8.8.8.8. .8 what is the IP address of the other one? So we can just look up Google, Google domain servers. If I can spell. Domain servers IP, for example. So for IPv4, it'll be 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 or 8.8.4.4. There's took out the Bellevue Golf Course. So let's try 8.8.4.4. So if if a DNS query has a TTL of 24 hours, what number would the dig query show? The 86,400 and yeah, just 400. And then task nine, further reading. So this completes the tour of the networking basics. You can go over here in a Cisco self-study guide by Steve McCurry. So this is another resource you can use to uh, continue learning. Other than that, that's it for this room. Um, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.